My name is Derek Pridmore. I'm the CEO of Asaro, and the topic of my talk today is industrial robotics and deep reinforcement learning. Uh, I just wanted to gauge the audience really quickly. How many people in here are machine learning researchers? Okay. How many people come from industry? Cool. Okay. How many of you know a lot about robots? Cool. Okay. Great. Well, I hope you all had your uh, coffee, and thanks for staying for the last talk. Uh, I'll try to be as interesting as I can make it. Um, so over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to try to give you a quick primer on the history and basics of deep reinforcement learning so you have some context. Uh, I'll also describe the robotics and automation landscape and discuss some of the problems in that um, field that deep reinforcement learning might solve. Uh, and I'll show you a bit of how we approach uh, the problem at Asaro, um, as well as discuss some of the research work that we think is interesting and relevant. Um, it's hard to summarize a topic in 30 minutes, um, but I'll try to provide some insight, in the, in, insight into the state of deep reinforcement learning uh, as it applies to industrial robotics. Uh, I'll also end with a few caveats and, and comments on, on the future of deep reinforcement learning for robotics. Uh, so uh, as the um, moderator mentioned, Asaro is a San Francisco-based company. We're um, building, we're an enterprise software and solutions provider. We build uh, advanced perception and control solutions uh, for big companies. Uh, and simply put, we're trying to build brains for robots. Uh, we're an amazing team of 20 uh, full-time engineers and machine learning researchers, all with advanced degrees in either deep learning, reinforcement learning, uh, computer science, and a few mathematicians and physicists. Um, we come from institutions like MIT, Stanford, and CMU. Um, and we also really heavily emphasize uh, industrial experience, so our team has experience at companies like Samsung, uh, eBay, Amazon, and others. Um, so I'd like to motivate uh, the discussion of, of why deep reinforcement learning um, uh, by pointing out that we'd like to solve industrial automation uh, problems in a wide variety of situations. And the reason why we're talking about deep reinforcement learning is there's a feeling that um, it's going to be a big enabler of this. And the question is why. Um, oops. Uh, traditionally, robotics has relied on really heavily engineered features as representations. Um, these features might leverage expensive sensors that tell you exactly where things are, so structured LiDAR um, is an example, uh, and give you things like the exact location of the object, but you might have to engineer those features for very specific objects or situations, and then when you move to the next uh, situation, you have to do it all over again. What we'd rather do is use learned representations from very high dimensional inputs like cameras, uh, especially low cost cameras. Um, and, and the idea is to just think of all the things that a human could do, um, the kinds of systems you could control uh, with just a camera input. And this is, I'll show you an example of this later. We, this is not just a thought experiment, this is what we do at Asaro. Um, so really quickly, deep reinforcement learning is, is the merger of two technologies, deep learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, most of you have probably heard of deep learning. Its history started in the 60s with perceptrons and Rosenblatt's, and the next innovation was backprop. And then it's been a long period of hibernation when, uh, where people like Jan LeCun and, and Jeff Hinton uh, were carrying the torch while we waited for both algorithmic improvements and uh, computational uh, improvements. So uh, GPUs in particular led to, to big breakthroughs in the late 2000s. Um, with the publication of AlexNet in 2012 uh, and, the, and the sort of convergence uh, on convolutional neural network architectures for doing classification, um, the field really took off and started, started to get widespread adoption. Um, and the general concept with these connectionist models is that uh, you know, data goes in one side, you perform a bunch of, uh, you compose a bunch of nonlinear uh, computations, and you propagate it all the way up to the top, uh, output something, uh, a label, you compare it to your, your actual training data, you'll have some difference, you backprop that information, you update the weights, and what happens after you do this hundreds of thousands of times is that you have this network where at the higher levels of the network you have sort of hopefully more general representations that, that are uh, usable in a, in a variety of domains. So that's, it's primarily a supervised learning technique. When you move to the control domain, labels don't necessarily exist. So for instance, in the process of learning to walk, you, you aren't given uh, hundreds of thousands of images with all of your joint angles labeled. You, you simply walk around and sometimes you fall over and you get a negative reward when it hurts. Um, so uh, instead of labels, we get a reward, which is in general a weaker signal. Um, so reinforcement falls somewhere between supervised and unsupervised learning, and it's a framework for dealing with that delayed reward signal. Um, it learns control policies, which are a way of acting. So when an agent's in a state, it chooses an action according to its current policy. 
uh, and then it receives a reward for executing that action. It transitions to a new state, uh, hopefully learns from the reward it got, and then chooses a new action, and then iterates through this. And the goal is to maximize the total reward over time. And that Bellman equation there is, is, uh, is what's used to essentially um, take these rewards and update your estimate of the value of being in any given state. It's the discounted uh, sum of future rewards. So traditionally, uh, RL was limited to domains with very simple state representations. But in order to move toward the high dimensional control domains, um, like we talked about with robotics, you need to use deep learning to learn the representations. And these representations can be learned at the same time as control policies. And that's essentially what deep reinforcement learning is. The idea to combine neural networks with reinforcement learning is not new. Uh, in fact, T.D. Gammon uh, used neural networks uh, and reinforcement learning. It was done by Jared Tesoro in 1995. Um, but the best known work and the paper that kicked off all the interest in the field um, was from a company called DeepMind. Uh, and it's their DQM paper that was published in 2013. They followed up in 2015 with a Nature paper. Uh, they worked in the um, uh, ALE domain, so someone packaged up all the Atari games, and they were able to, to uh, construct an architecture, an algorithm, which is able to learn uh, dozens of Atari games and can play them at human level proficiency with no hand-coded features. So you're starting to see um, some sort of general control. There's a variety of deep reinforcement learning algorithms and architectures that have been developed since then over the past three or four years. Each of them has their own emphasis, and I've listed a, a few here. Uh, just to give you some examples. So for instance, A3C is an algorithm that's geared toward learning asynchronously, asynchronously across parallel systems. Um, likewise, DDPG uh, extends deep reinforcement learning from uh, discrete domains like Atari, where you can only go up and down, to more continuous control domains. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll revisit some of the more uh, recent research toward the end of the talk. So one popular area of interest to mention within deep reinforcement learning has become imitation learning. Uh, in imitation learning, a mentor provides demonstrations to replace the random neural network initializations with a better initial policy. It's a way of sort of what we call warm starting the algorithm. Conceptually, this makes a lot of sense. Um, if you think about um, most of what you learn in your life, you rarely learn from scratch. You're almost always given examples. Um, so if you think about teaching a child to learn a bicycle, you would never just throw the bicycle out in the backyard, push the kid out the door, and say good luck. Um, what you actually do is put the kid on the bicycle and guide them through the motions. So you give them a rough policy and then they refine it. Uh, and that's the basic idea with imita imitation learning. Um, so here is some work. Um, so Asara was founded uh, basically on the notion that, uh, that leveraging imitation learning uh, would allow us to build scalable deep reinforcement learning solutions um, that could learn in a commercially useful amount of time. So on the left here, you see, um, so both these are deep reinforcement learning algorithms. They've learned um, from pure pixels using nothing but the reward, uh, which is the score. And the agent, the algorithm that we've trained is the green paddle in each case, and it's playing against the built-in Atari player. Uh, on the left, you have something like um, our own version of, of DeepMind's DQN algorithm. And on the right, you have a version that we built that uses imitation learning to first warm start the algorithm. So both of these algorithms are 10 games in. Uh, the algorithm on the, on the left will require thousands more games before it's able to converge to an optimal policy. But the algorithm on the right, you can see already qualitatively performs much better. Um, and it actually goes on to win after just 10 games. So it only loses two points. Um, and that's the sort of speed up that you're hoping to get with imitation learning. Um, so as you recall, I motivated the discussion by saying we want to solve automation problems in a wide variety of situations. Uh, so the question is, how do companies do that now in industrial robotics? Um, right now, well, first off, most industrial uh, robotics deployments are open loop, meaning they don't even have sensors. So they have highly structured environments that are very sensitive to calibration, and they simply do the same thing over and over again. So if you were to move one item in the scene by a few millimeters, it would stop working. You need to stop the line, recalibrate. Um, those policies are fixed. They're typically programmed by, by an integrator. Um, and they require a lot of hardware-based solutions like shaker tables and uh, conveyor belts in order to physically constrain the situation. Um, they also, when they do, in the, in the few cases where they do use sensors, they typically use very expensive sensors that can cost tens of thousands of dollars. So the hope is that deep reinforcement learning can let us move to more unstructured situations where you simply generalize. You don't. Um, you give it examples through data. You don't program it, uh, where you can improve and adapt through time, even if things like cameras are shifting around. 
Um, hopefully, uh, also, uh, deep reinforcement learning will give you the ability to, to use low-cost sensors and, uh, and have a more software-based solution. So where does the industrial robotics market stand today? Um, the International Federation of Robotics estimates the hardware market for industrial robots um, at somewhere around 15 to 20 billion dollars. That's probably an underestimate because it doesn't include a lot of collaborative robots. So industrial robots are robots like these. Uh, about 300,000 of them are sold every year um, by the top five uh, robot manufacturers, um, ABB, KUKA, Fanuc, Yasukawa, and KHI. Um, so the typical use case is for um, automotive applications and, and about a third to a half the robots are welding robots. Um, but you're starting to see a lot of hardware startups in the space as well. So companies like Fetch on the upper left that make both an AGV and a research robot. Uh, you'll see one of their robots in some of the research I mentioned later. Um, companies like Universal Robotics on the upper right are starting to get traction. And then you have Rethink as well as uh, um, hardware manufacturers uh, like uh, Right Hand Robotics who also offer services um, where they try to provide picking services. So in our minds, the landscape breaks down something like this. You've got um, hardware manufacturers and, and software developers, and they have varying degrees of applied or research focus. So on the bottom right, you have companies like DeepMind and Google Brain that are doing pure research and putting out algorithms. On the upper left, you have industrial robotics companies that are making um, extremely robust hardware that can operate over millions of cycles but doesn't have very much software with it. Um, Asaro is trying to build industrial, industrially useful uh, solutions, but we also have a strong research element to the products we build. So if you think about uh, the, the hardware market numbers that I gave you before, they're actually relatively small rel uh, sort of relative to the amount of attention that AI gets. Um, and, and the question is why. So the average uh, industrial robot costs around $50,000. So like I said, there's around 300 to 400,000 robots sold a year. They're around 2.5 million in deployment. Um, and the question is, why aren't there more? The, the hardware is great. It's, you can operate it through millions of cycles, and it'll be um, millimeter precise um, for years. You can amortize these investments over decades, at least 10 years. Um, and if you could upload a human brain somehow onto the robot or have a human controlling it and achieve parity with a human, you would instantly have a return on investment of you know, 2x to 5x because you could run a robot all the time. So why don't more people do this? And the answer is uh, software. So soft, com soft costs dominate hard costs in robotics. So the cost of integrating a robot can be five to 10 times the cost of actually buying the robot. Um, and that's the major problem here. So that, that money is spent paying an integrator to write custom code uh, or to provide you with other hardware that, that they use to constrain the environment so that they can use uh, either no sensors or very hard-coded uh, policies. So if we could, um, leverage deep reinforcement learning, how could we deploy more robots? Where would we use them? What would be suitable tasks for them? Um, right now, deep reinforcement learning is suited to tasks that don't need a ton of data uh, in order to train. So you're not going to use these um, algorithms to learn to tie your shoes. You're, first, you're going to use them to do simple things like pick up objects and place them. Um, you want to focus, and we're focused on fault tolerant industries, so you're not going to use these systems to perform heart surgery. You're going to do something where if you drop an item, you can simply pick it up again. Um, but you want to look at um, domains where there's enough variation that explicit modeling doesn't work. Um, and you might want to look at applications where it's very easy to define a goal if you're going to use full-blown deep reinforcement learning. So what are the kinds of applications we're talking about? E-commerce automation is a big one. So the facility shown here is called an ASRS. It's a big shuttle system that stores products in it, um, and it moves them around really efficiently. Uh, but at the very end, right before the product gets shipped to a user, a person is standing there and, and grabs the item out and puts it in a box. And they do that all day long. They have to do it about once every four to five seconds. Um, companies like Amazon and JD spend uh, billions on human pickers. Um, but picking is not restricted to e-commerce. Uh, there are also tons of applications in manufacturing, including, uh, including automotive, um, which is an application you see here. So the automotive industry is the most automated. There's one robot for every 10 employees. Um, and then if you look at general manufacturing, though, there's very little robot de um, deployment or penetration. So anything that you have that has an electric, um, that has a, a cable in it, basically, was plugged in by hand by a person. So there, there are hundreds of thousands of people who do this. And in general manufacturing, there are only about, there's only about one robot for every 200 employees, so very low penetration of automation. 
And then looking at industries that have no uh, automation, uh, you have things like textiles where um, by its nature, um, cloth and clothing are, are hard to manipulate. That's still an outstanding problem. And you also have things like the food preparation industry where, again, fault tolerant, it's not going to matter terribly if you destroy a, a single chicken nugget, um, but every chicken nugget looks different, and so you do need some way to generalize across, um, uh, across applications. So what's some of the latest research that we think is interesting and relevant to solving this problem? Uh, most of this research is being done at a combination of companies and academic labs. So the companies include um, Google Brain, Google DeepMind, um, Facebook, and others. Um, top academic institutions like UC Berkeley, Stanford, and CMU. You've got independent research organizations like OpenAI, and then you have um, industrially focused companies like Rosaro, Banzai, and others. Where does most of the research in the field focus? What are the problems that people are trying to solve? Generally speaking, most deep reinforcement learning papers address one of these four concerns. Um, so sample efficiency is sort of obvious. You'd like to learn as quickly as possible. Um, if you learn, if you, if you look at um, generalization and transfer learning, the motivation is if you, want, if you learn on one robot, robot A, and you move to robot B that's slightly different, say its indefector is a different color or maybe even slightly differently shaped, uh, you wouldn't want to have to start over from scratch. You'd like to just try at first and maybe not be quite as good, but then improve over time. Um, with safe RL, the, the goal is to make sure you don't degrade a policy during the process of learning. So once you deploy something, if you're going to learn, you'd like to guarantee that it doesn't get worse before it gets better. Um, and then with policy evaluation, you're trying to answer the question of, you've trained a system, uh, now how well does it work? How quickly can you test it and verify uh, how it works? And so the research that I'll talk about in a second, um, each one of them sort of addresses different aspects of these problems. So I'll start with some older research um, that was pretty foundational. So um, learning contact-rich manipulation skills um, by Sergey uh, Levin at UC Berkeley is probably the first demonstration of deep reinforcement learning on a robot. Um, they leverage trajectory optimi optimization techniques to, um, and applied it to a high-dimensional robot domain. And they combined policy search methods uh, with neural networks to, to show reasonably sample efficient learning. So in this case, a PR2 was trained to do simple assembly tasks with a toy airplane. And they were able to achieve millimeter level precision with dozens of examples. Um, but one drawback here, and I'll discuss a few of the drawbacks with um, each of the papers that I talk about, because I think we often see videos and, and pictures of these um, demonstrations, and people tend to think that it just works. But um, in each case, there's usually some sort of limitation. If there was a magic algorithm, we'd all be using it. So here, the assumption, or rather the drawback, was that um, the training required explicit, explicit knowledge of the world at training time, which isn't always an, uh, a realistic assumption. So the idea is they didn't just use video. They also knew exactly where in the world every object was and what their goal was. That's um, impractical to, to label. Um, and there's some techniques I'll mention later that might help address that. Uh, but this got things moving in deep reinforcement learning. Um, another interesting paper that many of you might have uh, seen, uh, even in just the, the, the news, was uh, Google's Arm Farm paper. So this work focused primarily on generalization and transfer learning across robots. So if you could learn on robot, can you use the policy to, to control another robot? And in the setup, they had 14 arms grasping continuously for two months and generated 800,000 grasps and used that to train a controller that would work across robots. Um, and so the important result here was that it was totally da data driven uh, across non-identical uncalibrated robots and they didn't have access to explicit state so they were learning just from this high dimensional representation. But the problems are obvious. Uh, one, it took a lot of hardware and a long time. Um, very few uh, companies could afford to do this. Um, and the resulting policies were still poor. 80% grasp accuracy in a, in a bin that's pretty much full of, of items is, uh, is, isn't great. This is an example of some more recent work that we find very exciting from OpenAI. It's called Hindsight Experience Replay. Um, this work is geared toward the problem of, again, sample efficient learning, uh, and in particular the problem of dealing with sparse rewards. So I didn't talk a lot about it, but in reinforcement learning, what matters a lot is the reward that you're getting, and that has to be defined. That's what the user gives as opposed to labels. Um, but that can be hard to define in certain situations. And most, uh, in the easiest ways to, to define reward functions, it winds up being very sparse, i.e., 
success or failure at the very end of a long sequence of tasks. And that can make it hard to learn because for a long time you're not getting any signal. And so uh, what hindsight experience replay uh, does is a very clever trick for augmenting the data you have in order to learn from examples that don't result in success. Um, so again, very cool work, um, partially addresses the sample complexity problem, um, but it has some drawbacks. Um, one being that it relies on a special class of functions that might not apply to every problem. And uh, the other is that um, there's a technique called reward shaping that people typically use to solve the, the um, reward sparsity problem. And if you try to use it in combination with hindsight experience replay, it doesn't work very well. Um, this is some work from DeepMind uh, that extends their uh, deep deterministic policy gradient algorithm uh, to use demonstrations. So again, um, the idea is we would like to do sample efficient learning and we'd like to do that by leveraging demonstrations. Um, not every paper has a dramatic algorithmic innovation. This is, this is mostly innovation or rather engineering work, um, but they got some interesting results. Um, so here they worked both in simulation and on a real robot and, and tied them together. Uh, you see four different tasks um, of increasing complexity. They had rigid objects, semi-rigid, and eventually flexible objects that they manipulated. Um, and the authors were able to show that with 100 examples, which took about 15 minutes to demonstrate, uh, their system was able to converge to a proficient policy in around five additional minutes of learning, whereas it would have taken an hour or longer uh, using only sparse rewards. Um, so again, the caveat to note here is they, they only used explicit state, um, meaning they knew exactly where everything in the world was when they, when they did this. Um, so this technique might not apply to higher dimensional data. Um, this work from USC combines all the buzzwords that you've heard recently, so imitation learning, deep reinforcement learning, and GANs, generative adversarial networks, but it actually does it in a very um, interesting way. And um, so this work is geared toward, again, sample efficient learning uh, in settings where the demonstrator might be showing you multiple skills. Um, so the idea is, say I want to show you how to pick up a bottle. In some of my examples, I may pick it up from the top. In others, I may pick it up from the side. The algorithm, uh, would learn better if it knew that these are essentially two different kinds of skills. So I have two intentions, two modes of, of demonstrating. And if you, could, if you could do that, you might learn each of them separately as opposed to sort of averaging them and getting a, um, a, a poor policy. Um, sorry, and then in the graph here on the, on the top, they've given it uh, ex two goals. So the goal is to push these circles to the x's. Um, and when you allow it to learn which uh, examples it's seeing, it's able to go to both goals, but when you don't do that, it, uh, it averages. Uh, the problem with these techniques, like the problem uh, with, with most GANs papers, is that it's incredibly uh, difficult to get them to converge. They're very finicky, and they also require uh, many, many samples. Um, so this paper um, deals with uh, the last uh, sort of focus that I mentioned, which is policy evaluation. It's um, very interesting work from um, Phil Thomas and others at UT Austin where um, they're tackling the problem of how quickly can I evaluate policy performance. So the idea is you've taught the system something, now you'd like to understand how well it learned. And the paper presents a very surprising result, which is that um, uh, there's a policy which can evaluate uh, the learned policy, and it's different than the policy that you tried to learn, but it gives you a better estimate of how well you learned it. That may sound confusing, but the idea is I just tried to teach you how to play football, and now in order to judge how well you play football, I have you throw a baseball. That's relatively surprising. It turns out there's a class of functions that do that really well. And it's really important because what we'd like to be able to do is speed up testing of, of policies on robots. Uh, this paper from uh, Google Brain isn't technically deep reinforcement learning, but it has applications to it. Uh, in particular, um, it addresses sample efficient learning as well as a kind of transfer learning. Uh, and the idea here is that rather than uh, meticulously label video data after the fact, you could, you could instead use multiple camera views of the same action and have the images label each other using something called a contrastive loss function. And you're starting to see um, a lot more papers leveraging, um, I don't want to say this trick, but a technique like this. You're, um, you also see papers using this technique in pose estimation from um, binocular um, data. Uh, so this work has the potential to eventually make data collection and learning uh, easier, but for the time being, it's actually quite uh, uh, data intensive. Um, and so in order to, it would also need to address 
um, the ability to look to understand multiple intentions in order to leverage the promise of the technique, which is that a robot might eventually be able to watch a video and learn how to perform a demonstration or perform a task. Uh, again, this isn't exactly uh, deep reinforcement learning for ro robotics, but we find it interesting and, and potentially relevant in the long term. So value iteration uh, networks is, is really cool work done by a postdoc named Aviv Tamar at UC Berkeley uh, and a sometimes collaborator with Asaro. Uh, it won Best Paper Award uh, at NIPS in uh, December. And the paper is geared toward building algorithms that generalize better as well as being more sample efficient, where the idea is to embed a differentiable planning module inside a neural network uh, that can plan rather than just be reactive. So one problem with learning from demonstration is something called the compounding error problem. You typically have to show lots of examples and if the uh, agent or algorithm encounters later a scenario that hasn't seen before, it's likely to make a mistake and then wander off. What you'd like to be able to do in order to, to um, uh, perform better and use less samples in new environments is plan over environments. And so what, what Aviv is able to do here is show demonstrations of planning in one maze environment on the left and change the maze and the algorithm can still plan. And it can do this in a way that uses backpropagation uh, in neural networks. So it's very compatible with deep reinforcement learning. Um, I'll, I'll hurry through uh, the rest of these. So again, this is, uh, this is more of a pure deep learning paper, but um, if you're gonna be focused on functionality and not just um, you know, techniques, we're going to need to extend deep learning to um, different kinds of data. So for instance, if you want to model uh, a data distribution that comes from a complex stochastic latent structure, so uh, a variable that's random uh, and, and very complex, you might not be able to use a simple convolutional neural network. So this work from Ryan Adams' lab at Harvard is able to combine probabilistic graphical models and, and deep networks and leverage sort of the nice properties of each one of them. Um, so I'm running out of time. Um, One-shot imitation learning. Uh, Chelsea Finn at, at Berkeley and OpenAI is um, a very uh, prolific researcher in the field. Uh, One-shot imitation learning is essentially uh, sample-efficient learning taken to its extreme. You'd like to be able to show a robot one demonstration of something and, and have it learn. So this is some interesting work they've done, although note that right now there's no way to get these algorithms to learn to be 100% um, uh, accurate after just one demonstration, and I'll talk about that in the context of uh, in industry in a second. Um, and then there's work from um, Google doing things that are sort of um, uh, interesting long-term research where you, you eventually want to be able to just give a robot high-level semantic information like grab me a bottle and it does it, and you'll need to be able to provide those labels at the same time that you're learning. Um, so that's some of the research we think is interesting. I just wanted to uh, summarize with a few thoughts. Um, a lot of the results in deep reinforcement learning are, are sort of perhaps inadvertently aggressively marketed. So you'll see the videos without the caveats and it leads people to think that these algorithms are just being applied everywhere. Um, what are the limitations right now in deep reinforcement learning? It's still that they are slow and unstable to train. Uh, they require lots of data um, and generalizing across environments is still, is still difficult, but there's lots of research going on in that area. Um, what do customers actually care about? Speed. So they definitely want to be able to learn fast, but they also want to be able to move quickly. Um, so you, you can't sacrifice either speed or um, reliability. So a customer doesn't care if you can generalize across the 10 tasks they, they do if you're only 80% good at all of them. You're actually going to have to be almost 100%. They generally say 99.99% to give you a little bit of room for error. Um, but uh, they also care a lot about explainability. So when an algorithm fa fails, um, if you're doing end-to-end -end learning, you may not actually know what it was trying to do, especially in a new unseen situation. Um, but there are potential ways of addressing that, and there have been talks earlier in the year at O'Reilly about that. And then there are some just really simple issues like infrastructure. A lot of the techniques you see here are very computationally intensive, and they require you know, clusters of GPUs that are typically done in the cloud, uh, and they even need GPUs to execute the policies. And yet, uh, if you buy an industrial robot, the computer that comes with it to control it does not have a GPU in it. So, um, so that's something to think about. So the message is that uh, deep reinforcement learning is not a magic bullet that fix ev fixes everything. It's certainly uh, the stack of uh, algorithms uh, and uh, infrastructure that controls robotics is going to need to evolve to include deep learning and reinforcement learning, but you're still going to have classical robotics planning, 
uh, as well as uh, things like simulation and data augmentation. And so I mentioned before, at Asura, what we think about is we had this thought experiment of how could we control a robot if we literally had a human um, you know, doing it remotely? Because eventually that's what we will have. You'll have an algorithm that's so powerful it can look at almost any sort of visual feed and control any kind of system. And so here's an example of um, some of the work we do. So this is a software system that we, ha we use for integrating industrial robots. And it does it using uh, human demonstrations. So here the algorithm is running, uh, performing a complex bin picking task where it's separating out these dowels. Um, it uses a very low cost sensor. And it was trained with human demonstrations um, via a couple different input modes. We have a VR rig uh, that we use. And we also have a 3D mouse that we can use to guide the robot to provide simple demonstrations. We have a head up, heads up display that lets you monitor the data as you're recording it and infrastructure for saving that data down, manipulating it, and combining it. Um, we use imitation learning to warm start these policies, but one problem with imitation learning is that a human may show you an inefficient policy, like they may raster over and then go down as opposed to going directly to it. But we've shown that um, you can use imitation learning, or rather uh, reinforcement learning, to uh, overcome that. One of the nice things you get out of using um, deep learning and reinforcement learning is that you have much, much faster control policies, so you can react to changes in the situation in almost real time. And you can also use uh, relatively low cost sensors to manipulate difficult products that are thin, plastic, transparent, um, that, where things are sitting inside a, a clear plastic box, for instance. Um, and we think of our system as sort of a, a learnable self-driving car system for robots um, where you do things like scene understanding as well. Um, and that's an example of a pretty difficult product. If you look at this under a structured light sensor, the, the, the structured light just reflects everywhere because you've got, perversely, the things that humans like to buy tend to be coated in shiny stuff and then covered by clear wrappers. Um, so it turns out to be pretty hard to pick up. Um, so again, uh, there's no one magic algorithm that's going to solve this problem. Um, we think you need to rethink the entire stack and start layering in deep and reinforcement learning uh, where, it's, where it's relevant. Um, there are some long-term questions about where and how to employ reinforcement learning, especially since you can provide demonstrations to dramatically accelerate this process. Um, another uh, conclusion that you should draw is that in the future we're going to need a lot more robots because the algorithms are moving very quickly. Um, and once you have that human brain in a box, we only have three million robots in the world, so we're probably going to need a lot more. Um, and the ultimate goal is to automate anything you can uh, quickly teach a human to do. Uh, and that's it. So with that, I will take some questions. So you mentioned uh, the simulation can be done during the reinforcement learning process, right? Mm -hmm. So, and also you mentioned in the Google Arm, it takes uh, quite some long time for the robots to get used to grab something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, my question is, uh, how is simulation can play a role uh, before the real hardware test is done? And how much time it can save uh, in this process? Thank you. Yeah, uh, we use it in two basic ways. Uh, one is simply for prototyping algorithms. So you could have synthetic robots that are running and essentially getting the same kind of data they would get. It might not be quite as visually complex, although it depends on how good the simulator is you're using. Um, so you can use that to spec out algorithms and see how uh, and develop them more quickly than, than you would if you were having to run the robot every single time. So that's the first way. The second way is to actually do transfer learning, which is you learn in simulation, then you take that trained controller and either directly use it or retrain it. Um, and that's an area of ongoing research. It's not clear how much that speeds things up. Uh, most of the transfer learning that's actually done now is very tailored to the problem that they're working on. Um, but there's a lot of interesting work um, around you know, building much more accurate simulators. Um, a lot of, you see a lot of papers using um, Grand Theft Auto, for instance, in the self-driving car domain to get extra data. But I, I think one drawback there, um, when you're actually trying to take uh, simulation and apply it to the real robot is that simulating the physics, especially contact physics, is actually quite hard. Uh, and um, you, you can't necessarily rely on the results you get from a, from a simulation to do those types of tasks. So it's, it's almost better for, for doing things that don't interact physically with the environment. You just need to sort of see things.
That was exactly my question, so. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Two birds with one stone. So you usually see, um, I guess, deep reinforcement learning uh, working on, I guess, single agents or maybe one agent trained across multiple, you know, using that same trained agent across multiple agents. Mm -hmm. uh, is there research going on with them interacting with each other sort of thing? Yeah, and there's actually a really cool paper that just came out from OpenAI. Um, I don't remember the title of it, but the acronym is LOLA, L-O-L-A. And they, they have a framework for allowing agents to modify each other's policies mm -hmm. so that they can collaborate. And the, the, um, the setup is you have a red agent and a blue agent, and you have red coins and blue coins. Uh, you get a point for every coin you pick up. So if you can pick up every coin, you get the most points. But if you pick up uh, one of the other agent's coins or they pick up one of yours, you get minus two points. So that if you both greedily pursue the policy of getting the most points, you actually lose. Uh, and so what they come up with is a clever way of both updating their own policy to improve, but then updating the other agent's policy as well to benefit themselves. And they show that when they train the algorithms in this way, they actually achieve the optimal result, which is that each agent picks up its own coins without, without using the others. And this is really important if you're going to use things like reinforcement learning to optimize large systems that have interlocking resources and may have, you know, may care about their own individual optimizations, but you don't want them to ruin the global optimization. Okay, thank you for coming. And if you have more questions, you can. Cool. Thanks.